It's the Bird Emergency. Hello, 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 bird nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This is the show where I get to speak to really clever people who are studying and unlocking the secrets of really amazing birds. And the entry criteria is that they're endangered, threatened, critically endangered. And today we're back in the Southern Hemisphere today. I'm speaking with Dr. Ursula Allenberg who is a penguin person. Hello, Ursula. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, Grant. Good to meet you, finally. <laughs> I only know you via Twitter. Sorry, I was just laughing and, and thinking, oh, no, she's read my Twitter feed. She's seen my, she's seen my ranty Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> I do occasionally when I get distracted, yeah. <laughs> Tell me, where, whereabouts are you located? We. You mentioned New Zealand, the long white cloud, but you're not up in uh, Auckland and the and and the Sea Petrel Gulf area, are you? No, no, we're down south, Southern Girl down in and Dunedin, and we're working around the Southern South Islands and the Southern Arctic Islands. So we miss out on the, that terrible storm, luckily, but yeah, we have other things to deal with down here. So it's bloody cold, actually. Do you want to see? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's it's the middle of summer and you have a lap rug. Uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's so New Zealand. It's That fits all the cliches. The only thing you haven't done is say, said, hey, bro. Or, <laughs> uh, Ashley, tell us a little bit about the habitat that the penguin that we're going to be discussing, the Tawaki. How's my pronunciation? Tawaki is perfect, yeah. Tawaki. Or Never too so what? what we knew about this bird in bird books when I was growing up is that it was called the Crested Fjordland Penguin. Is that yeah. the, the old name? So yeah. is that how you refer to the bird now in scientific literature or has the Maori name been widely accepted in general communication? I guess we're making it more more popular. It's like the official Fjordland crested penguin. It's quite lengthy and a mouthful. And Tawaki is unique. Everybody, it's it might not be the big seller because calling yourself the Tawaki Project and not have penguin in there, people miss you. So we we dropped that code word penguin to draw people in from around the world. But I hope by talking more about Tawaki, people start to care about them because he's not a penguin like any other. Penguin. They're very special, unique penguins. And you t you asked me about the habitat. We're just over there, just coming back now to Malt. And you go, it's quite rugged and remote. Imagine yourself crawling. You've been to Milford. You've seen Milford, for example, if you picture Fjordland. These really uh, steep we, We've pools. all seen pictures. We've all seen yeah. pictures of Milford Sound. Come over, man. You, it's, you, you need to see it in life because it's still, after so many years, it's breathtaking being in these deep fjords. You have these sheer walls that drop down hundreds, uh, thousands of meters, actually, and waterfalls and things. And in between there are little um, nooks and crannies, old boulder fields where now ancient forest grows on top. And it's a tangle in several stories. So imagine... It's like a multi-story apartment with these thick roots and old moraine boulders. And Tawaki, they don't nest like other penguins and, and big colonies. They're tucked away in these in, in between these old moraine boulders and tree root caves. So you get down on your tummy and crawl and disappear. I need to send you some pictures. Like you, you, you disappear in that network of old moraine boulders and it's it requires some guts uh, to work with Tawaki because then you turn a corner and follow your nose. You feel a bit wild and you smell, oh, there's penguin. And then you go turn a corner and then you have your Tawaki nesting in a little beautiful nest bowl with a few sticks, decorated stones and looking after their fluffy chicks, hopefully. And so then you go take, yeah, another nest you can count. One of the things I noticed when looking through the website is there's a lot of fallen timber in the environment. So there's lots of old trees, decaying trees and whatnot. Mm. And let's set the scene for people who aren't, whose only experience of penguins perhaps is through David Attenborough shows and whatnot. You have penguins that nest on ice flows and on mm. beaches and incubate eggs basically on the feet of one parent mm. keeping it off the ground. Then you have penguins that excavate their own burrows and our little penguin 
in Australia is like that, and mm -hmm. the New Zealand little penguin, or how do we say that? No, oh, no, the hoi ho is the yellow-eyed penguin. Uh, it's the, you ah. just if you listen, because uh, Maori used to describe how they, they're, they're called the, the kia or kaka, like these uh, famous parrots, the korora. Yeah, and you've heard probably a little penguins calling in Melbourne, just off the pier when they're coming mm -hmm. back. They have these contact calls, go quack, quack. And then they come and have this mutual display and go down there. So that's your korora. And the hoi ho is the noise shouter. It's more like a very high pitched. I shouldn't do that. Are we live? In the entertaining part of the discussion. <laughs> yeah. But the, I, I, I got off the track a little bit it, for a change. But the, the tawaki is different in that it's not a burrower and it's yeah. not nesting on ice flows like the Antarctic and the sub Antarctic penguins but i was curious when i was looking at all the photos of the habitat and these birds poking their heads up from fallen logs and whatnot do they make use of things like hollows and crevices that naturally occur when trees fall over each other and spaces are, are left and like you mentioned that these beaches or these hillsides are formed by boulders that were expelled from Volcanic eruption. No, that's all no? glacial, glacial. Oh, it's, like glacial. it's all glacial yeah. rub glacial yeah. ru uh, rubbish that yeah. carved out from from the mountains. Okay, so do the penguins utilise those crevices, or do they, like you said, there's a nest bowl that they decorate? Do they have to have a clear space? How? What do they need? Oh, it's like a hobbit hole. You go, they, they find these nice, dry, lovely spaces between old moraine boulders or in tree root caves. And then they make it them, their own. They excavate it a bit more and make a lovely nest bowl and move in, make it cozy, bring that one leaf and put it somewhere and just own it. And then they shit all over it. And that's how you find them, following your nose. Are they utilising their renovator's dream? To, to anthropomorphize them. Are they utilizing these nest scrapes or mm. clearings or whatever they've made for themselves all year round or are they disappearing out to sea for extended periods? What's the annual cycle of, of a tawaki? Okay, a, a tawaki, currently they just came back to malt, which means where they, they fatten up during their pre-malt journey, which they... Just the last, over the last six weeks, they've been all the way down to the subarctic front, some 2,500 case, like a six kilometer, a 6,000 kilometer round journey. And, and now they come back weighing twice the weight, can barely walk. They go up the beach, are humongously fat and fall a few times over and then lock themselves into the forest and find a, a nice little nook where they can hide from the weather, but still have access to some drinking water and some wind when the sandflies get too pestering and shed all their feathers at once. So that's most birds will lose a feather here and there during their annual cycle. Penguins, they, they need their dive suit. It's, if you imagine uh, penguin feathers being more like scales and thousands of them overlapping each other, they form that dive suit, and once they have holes in that dive suit, they don't like to to swim in that cold ocean. So they need to fatten up first, go ashore, shed all their feathers, which is called a catastrophic molt, and it looks catastrophic. It's, it looks like a kind of a firecracker and a down pillow experiment going wrong, and uh, some people get really worried about them because they look really shitty. But the best you can do is leave them in peace when they're um, in that stage because they need all their energy. They don't need to be freaked out. They need all that energy, all that fat. Half of their body weight gets metabolized into these new feathers. And then in another two or three weeks, they, they have this shiny new dive suit. They take for a spin around the fjord, fatten it a bit, oil it another couple of days to make it really shiny. And then they take off on a more leisurely, maybe four to five months uh, winter migration where they head again down to the uh, subarctic front and hang out. Uh, it's not, it's, they actually, if you picture it, they go now, s since we've worked on them, we know now they're going south and past Tasmania, further west. So you can stand on the shores of Tasmania, wave them as they pass and find a really cool spot for fattening up and preparing for the breeding season. So back in the days when we started, we had no idea. We just knew they disappeared and then they would come back again. So sometime uh, in late July, August to set up a nest and start incubating. 
and they're winter breeders. So when we try to work with them, we actually have to battle snow down to sea level and it's crazy. So winter breeders, they set up shop, usually hatch their eggs in September and mid-September, mid-October is the chick rearing period. And I say, the, you know, chicks hatch and are really fragile, like very fine down and need that to look after them as they grow because they can't thermoregulate themselves as, as they're really little. And mom's out foraging, like mom's the hunter in the family. So she's out foraging, bringing back uh, food for the little one and poor dad starving on the nest and getting really thin again. But proud dad steps up. And eventually the chicks get big enough to be left alone. And then both parents are out foraging and feeding that chick until it's fat enough and ready to learn what it takes to be a penguin during its first life a uh, year. So many questions, but the <laughs> first one, when, when, they're out, when they're out at sea after they've molted and when they go out to sea to fatten up and they hang a shallow right turn at, the, at Tasmania, are they still hanging around in a loose what do we call it would that be a flock or a school or if they're on if they're on top of the sea would it be a raft what yeah actually what you would call them uh, like little penguins come in as rafts kind of find safety in numbers and then as the night falls they come and waddle across the beach quickly so no eagle can pick them up or and eat them tawaki don't have that that problem so they they do socialize in the fjords and have fun going for a spin with three or four other mates. And actually, we've deployed camera loggers we recently developed. And last season had a really nice spin. I need to send you the link of uh, a girl taking off with a few of her girlfriends. And just cry the sheer speed, they zoom through the water. And you can tell they, they have fun before they go out um, and do the hard day's work uh, foraging and feeding the family. But out in, in the deep southern ocean, there's so few Tawakis. They all uh, take the general, same general direction, but they'll be pretty solitary. There might be a couple hanging out together, but we, we're talking about so few birds. They're not going out in, in, a, in a big, big team. They spread out. That, that means I must ask the question, what's the <laughs> estimated population and how reliable do you think that population count is? Okay, the initial, when we started um, with our project, the official count was five to 7,000 birds. And then we started looking and we saw so many more. Then uh, it was mind boggling actually, because those are counts, Fjordland or the West Coast, they're really difficult places to grip. And there's been a, a fantastic uh, work in the early 90s by McLean and, and colleagues to go and try to get to a population estimate. And for example, we have one person on the team, you might know Robin Long, daughter of the Long family, raising New Zealand's remotest family. She grew up with Tawaki in her backyard. And she, yeah, so uh, like back in the days when she was little, it took them three days to get out there. Now she runs the 50k or so to, to her family home in, in a day with a light pack. But she started counting penguins on the West Coast and uh, those same areas that McLean and people counted. And in that one example, McLean searched with four people and found some, and I need to look up the numbers, some 40 something penguins and nests. And then Robin came in and it looks as if over the last 10 years, the population would have dramatically increased. It's really, she found every year she went back in to search for nests, she found more because she, she reckons it took her about five years to learn where to look and how to find them. And now over the last couple of years, the numbers have stabilized at 370 pairs, roughly. So that's ten, tenfold of what we initially thought was there. So we're at the very beginning, we don't really know how many there are exactly, but we can say there's a lot more than we thought there were. And that's, and that's, that's amazing news that we actually have a penguin species, especially crested penguins. They're really struggling, declining. We lost of the rock hopper penguins more than 90% of the population. And here we have a penguin, the Tawaki, that's doing exceptionally well. And it's just so reassuring. Mind you, they still need a lot of help because they nest too close for comfort um, to people, to like 
people are often the problem for wildlife, as you know, Grant, but they're doing much better than we thought. And I think you got to celebrate that good news. Definitely. It's not that often that we hear good news when we talk about endangered rare birds. That's generally the other way around. For birds that spend much of their life at sea, one of the great threats that causing mortality is fishing. Mm. Now, is that a problem for Tawaki? And let's broaden it out to the New Zealand penguins in general. It's at, like penguins are pursuit divers. So they go and follow their prey and thus uh, they they won't be going on long lines. There's one example of a penguin being foul hooked through a flipper accidentally, but it's not like the albatross that die being hooked on long lines. Penguins drown in nets and particularly in gill nets or set nets, as we call them here on New Zealand. They're, they're a, a huge problem, particularly for the yellow. And we don't quite know how much of an impact it has on Tawaki, but any net that is in a, uh, a Tawaki foraging area will catch Tawaki, and there are records of Tawaki being caught in set nets. Tawaki, like during the breeding season, like just like they have s some preferences and they like to forage quite coastal, quite close to these kelp forests. And that means anybody is going, for example, for butterfish would potentially catch Tawaki as well. So is there a large part of their, both their molting range and their, their, their foraging range? Because they, they, have, they have two two parts of the year, don't they, where they're feeding close to shore for part of the year and then for part of the year they're heading off to the sub-Antarctic. Are they often frequently in in places where gill netting is common or uh, are they and is it close to shore is, is the problem for the netting a a new zealand problem or is it, it an it international is. problem <laughs> no in fact for our penguins it's very much a new zealand problem that we need to manage and should it should be easier when you think about it because internationally it's much harder but for example the yellow-eyed penguin they are just occurring in new zealand so you'd hope that is something we we can yeah make happen make their life easier yeah. <laughs> we'd hope yeah uh, we have all the solutions we just need to get behind it and make them implement them make the sea a safer place for penguins but for Tawaki, I'm glad to report that along the West Coast and in Fjordland, there's very little overlap. So I think set netting in the southern fjords and around Stewart Island will take the odd Tawaki. But at the moment, it's not a threat for the entire population or, or species. Okay. Now, for international listeners who are not uh, New Zealand, the, the West Coast is the bit that <laughs> is, is facing Australia. And the Fjordland is the other side that that faces out to the Pacific. And no, 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 no. no it's all, all on the west coast. So it's we have all the west, the west coast. What, it's all the west coast. We have the west coast, or we call the northern part of our west coast, yeah. and then it drops into Fjordland, where you have these really deep fjords. It's but it's still on the west coast, and, and then, then it, as it comes and around, then round on round off the tip. On yeah, exactly. the east coast, isn't it? Okay. So how far round? So the stronghold is on the west coast, which is the, when you're looking on your, at your school atlas, children, it's the bit facing Australia and round to the bottom. <laughs> Let's say around the corner, do they occur? And do they nest any any further up the, up the east coast, the Pacific coast? Yeah, have the most restricted breeding range, actually, just over a mere 500 kilometres. And we had this year, for the first time since a long time, a nest um, in Bluff, actually. So all the way down really south. And we had, back in the day, some records where a, a pair attempted to breed on, on the east coast. But they certainly molt here. So we have the first few Tawaki arriving around Otago, currently and malt and hopefully finding a, a safe place away from humans and dogs where they can shed their feathers in, in peace. But yeah, and it's a very restricted breeding range and yet extremely diverse marine habitat from what I call the West Coast, although you can argue Fjordland is also in the West. The West Coast is continental shelf 
And then as you go drop down into Fjordland, you have these really deep fjords that as you leave the fjord, drop down in a, into a deep sea environment, like 2000 meters straight away as you go out into the Tasman Sea. And then you go around Favor Strait, which is that little strait that separates southern New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand South Island from Stewart Island. It's shallow coastal. It might be just uh, 40 meters deep. Where and, and they don't forage very deep. They can forage deep if they want to. But why put effort in if there's good food uh, close to shore and in shallower areas? Totally. Uh, people will be familiar with uh, Stewart Island, I think, if they are into rare birds and New Zealand birds, in that the kakapo is also on Stewart Island. So is the kaki and the kakapo, are they utilising similar habitats in that part? Will you find, will you be stepping over Tawaki nests and at the same time maybe see a kakapo scurrying away or are the habitats completely different? They, they are quite different. I might add Stewart Island currently doesn't have any kakapo on the main island. It's on Finnaho or Codfish Island, a ne small yeah, kind of door. island. Yeah. island. That's, that's predator-free because kakapo and predators, introduce predators, well, they don't well, they don't go that, along. Well, that, uh, that, <laughs> that was where I was going to go next. But that, let's talk about the differing habitats that they yeah. exploit because uh, New Zealand's been very successful in marketing itself worldwide as a tourist destination but i don't think people really know how diverse the different habitats are the the wild places of new zealand are at, and some habitats are extremely localized so tell us about that that southern portion of the south island yeah oh i might add a little anecdote actually because i've came across a kakapo working with yellow-eyed penguins on Fenaho. So we were hiding and waiting for yellow-eyed penguins to return from their foraging trips. And my field helper got really excited and heard rattling and, and crashing around the forest. And it was his first night in the forest. And I was, he was like, I think there's someone coming. It's like, wrong direction. You're heading, like, look to the beach. It's like, oh, there's some, it's really big and it's right next to me. It's, like, oh, it's a kakapo. <laughs> it's what the hell? I'm working here since decades. And he, in his first night, gets a kakapo walking over him as we're waiting for yellow-eyed penguins. It was amazing. So that really made us night. The next nights were, were less exciting, but just penguins. But they certainly hang around in these lower coastal, these podocarp forests, the, the kakapo. Oh, they prefer, they're spreading out across the entire island. They prefer the, uh, the higher hilly areas uh, when they do, the males especially, when they do their booming and attracting mates. But they can, they have feet. They might be flightless, those kakapo, but they can cover some distance. Yeah. Did, did you just refer to the forest as Podocarp forest? So Podocarpus, yeah. uh, we're familiar with, with that genus here. Is, is that the dominant, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be the dominant tree in the forest, but what kind of, all of the photos that I've seen and on your website, there's all these aerial roots, like the trees have got these spread out aerial roots as well as fallen logs and, and whatnot. Is that mostly podocarpus or is it a is it quite varied in the it's in incredibly diverse of forests over here we have you know lots of for example in harrison cove where i've just been last weekend there's a rock fall and it's been overgrown by pioneer fuchsia trees which have these curly quirky roots around these boulders from the rock fall and that's again, or we you have kamahi and other beautiful old rata trees. We have all sorts of very diverse trees, and and podocarps is, is a whole group of trees that are just in in that, yeah, in in that group. But it's quite diverse as well, and with different habitat requirements. And so you go through a west coast forest, and it's mind boggling. Not only the trees, all those different ferns and and mosses and lichens you have there, and little epiphytes. It's like growing and down in different stories. And you have these fallen big giants. A, um, Totara might be fallen or an old rata tree. And then there's seedlings on top of it that start to grow and be big trees again. So it's a even in a, in a very small, like a hectare, you have lots of different species that, yeah, nowhere. Uh, like it's, it's like it's hugely diverse. You as a botanist, I think most people... Look at a look at a forest or some greenery and say, "Oh, there's grass and shrubs and trees and other green shit," and then you have a botan 
going in and going, wow. And it's just popping out all these crazy Latin names. And it's, yeah, it's, I'm still learning and it's absolutely beautiful. Like you never get bored in that forest. How familiar do you think the general New Zealand public is with that really wild part of New Zealand? Do they understand how complex and unique and amazing it is? I think the the landscape is very much appreciated, like these crazy fjords and waterfalls and, and things. And a few people would go and be delighted about the diversity of ferns and other bryophytes, I imagine. But I think there's great appreciation uh, for the beauty. Although if you're not able to name different ferns, you can still appreciate how different they look and how beautiful they are and how decorative they are around a penguin nest, for example, especially when you grow up and see all these penguin documentaries and big colonies. And then suddenly you have these elusive rainforest penguins that sneak on little hobbit pathways into the forest and hide behind some trees and some ferns. That's probably a point worth exploring that we are, I mentioned at, at the start, that the day, all of the David Attenborough documentaries and all the recuts that have been done a million times over, have got us very familiar with Antarctic and sub-Antarctic penguins. Are New Zealanders familiar, do you think, with the three mainland breeding penguin? And what, uh, I think, is it 13 species of penguin recorded in New Zealand or is it yeah. more? No, it's 13 if you, depending on how you split them up. I Controversy. <laughs> like, we've got time to explore it. Let's, uh, okay. let, let's talk about that. We've talked about three species, the yellow-eyed, the the crested fjordland and the the little penguin now the little penguin in new zealand is a distinct species from the little penguin or fairy penguin as we were calling it here in in australia and sometimes they call them little blue penguins don't they yeah there's so many common names it's just although you can uh, get confused tawaki when they're freshly malted um sport a very blue coat as well so they're they so, can be so blue. You, so there's three species that breed mm -hmm. on the mainland. That's yes. correct, isn't it? Yes. Unless you split the little penguins up and then you have four because I'd say we probably have two different little penguin species. One, the New Zealand little penguin. That's around most of New Zealand and comparably less studied than um, the Australian little penguin that is mostly around Otago. So where I'm based, most of the penguins are actually like the little penguins. And as you go further north or around on the West Coast, that's mostly the New Zealand. You can call them subspecies. They're probably pretty close to, oh, there's good arguments to make them two separate species. But uh, I guess you can, it's all definitions. Like we don't argue about it. It's from a management point of view. Yeah, we need to learn more. Uh, about the New Zealand little penguins because we already know quite a bit about the Australian well, um, species or subspecies. Surely someone's doing a PhD on the genetic work to split those species. There's a good paper oh. in that, isn't there? Yeah, no, it's already published, actually. Stephanie okay. Grosser has done that and argued for two species. Which camp do you reside? I'm not too worried, actually. It's species is just a convention, and you can go with different definitions. Is, is it a biological species definition or some other uh, species definition? But I think as long as they don't and you have different for example different ducks that all hybridize and interbreed and we still think they're different species but in that they hybridize very little there's as far as i know they they breed quite separately so in the colonies uh, around Dunedin and Amaru it's mostly the australian little penguin and over for example on the west coast we have the new zealand little penguin and i'd argue they differ also slightly in in, in shape and size and some habits so for the for example the australian little penguin is much more productive so they can lay a two sometimes even three clutches in a season there's probably one record i think of a new zealand little penguin attempting a they do replacement clutches but actually raising two clutches is pretty unusual for little penguins for the New Zealand species or subspecies, which means they're more like they can't recover as fast from any disturbance as the more robust uh, Australian counterpart could. And I'm less worried about whether we call them a different species. I'm more worried about what we do from a conservation management perspective. If we want to safeguard them, 
we need to understand their um, biology and habitat requirements and we need to learn a lot more about our actual New Zealand little penguins. Yeah, and there's good work being done at the moment, mostly by community groups all around New Zealand. Good old citizen scientist. So we're, we're talking to Aki, but little penguins <laughs> are, are, are amazing. So just to extend that discussion a little further, if those two populations of the subspecies or species, however we classify them, are quite distinct, are they ecologically distinct as well? Do they occupy different niches within the environment or is one a functional replacement for the other in the different range? I guess I would split it up even further because we have such diverse marine habitats around New Zealand that they have they play different roles in their different habitats and have if you're a little penguin in Motuara going into the Favo Strait you need to go way further and put a lot more work in to feed your family than you would uh, if you feed off Omaru, which is, has very productive waters very close by. And so they go for different species, have their different favorite foraging hotspots and things. And in terms of replacement, we could... Oh, I'm surprised, like, after all these years, they haven't expanded further. Like, they're quite localized, our little penguins. They're still in Otago. So they quite like it here, and they're not that invasive, ex- expanding, crazy conquistador of penguins. They live <laughs> next to each other quite happily. So they're, they're not the rainbow lorikeet of the penguin world. I probably was misapplying the terminology replacement and whatnot, but I, get, I guess what I was wondering about is, is although, although they're foraging in different areas and they're not overlapping a lot, and the opportunities to forage are quite different because of the locations they're in. Are they choosing different foods? Do we know that? Like, is the specialisation actually got down to their dietary requirements? I I guess they are going uh, for what's there and whatever the habitat provides, and and they need to be um, adaptable in our changing environments. So they... Yeah, they do take a diverse range, but they like the small oily if they're available because that's good for raising chicks. High um, but, energy for the, yeah, for the exactly. amount of energy that they expend. Yeah, exactly. But as I say, we know comparably little about the New Zealand little penguins. So all our knowledge comes from Phillip Island, for example, and other really well-researched colonies around Australia. And then down here, Especially Omaru has been very, the Omaru blue penguin colony has been very uh, research um, intensive and have, yeah, but again, they have the Australian species or subspecies. That's, that's a surprising uh, to me. I don't know much. <laughs> I, I don't know much about penguins in New Zealand, obviously, because I've been labouring under the misapprehension that all the little slash fairy penguins in New Zealand were yours and that the odd straggler might turn up Australia. No, that's all Aussies here in Otago, um, Aussies rule. Which is funny, actually, because you'd expect the straggler arriving somewhere on the West Coast, but they actually established in Omaru and around the Otago Peninsula, for example. It would be really amazing to be able to examine the fossil record and the, the and the modern debris to, to actually determine who brought them here how, yeah how it happened when it happened but little penguins do they cover so much of the australian coast they're obviously great, great I think they, some of them even made it over to chile yeah i yeah, met yeah. A, a a stuffed little penguin in in chile and we wonder like how we don't really know much about the southern fjords who knows well, maybe they well, have some living little penguins down there as well in in Chile now. So uh, there's so much left uh, around this world we don't know. And that was really where I was going to go next. For countless thousands of years, probably, penguins had New Zealand to themselves. They had to share it with the kakapo and the kaka and the takahe and the wood hens and whatnot. But then the Maori arrived and... Mm -hmm. They started eating tawaki. Is that is that right? They yeah, were, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, probably uh, more yellow eyed, not the the pre- precessor of yellow eyed penguins. They got eaten to extinction or harvested to extinction some five hundred years ago. And but certainly we find all sorts of penguin uh, bones in mittens because it's a nice parcel. They come and you pick them up and can feed your family and you can transport them and trade with them. 
So <coughs> lots of communities around the world have been eating um, penguins. Go over humble penguins um, in, in Chile. They've been eaten by a coastal community since more than 11,000 years. And you as hunters, you change the population because you pick the easy prey and the survivors are the shy ones. Which yeah. means that's why we have so many extremely shy, humbled penguins. They have learned that people are predators that might potentially eat them. And same with Tawaki and yellow-eyed penguins here. They were just too easy prey. So they got they grew wary of people. Is there only one known penguin species that has been wiped out as a result of human interference in New Zealand? And no, there's a, a crested penguin on the Chatham Islands that has also been hunted to extinction. Okay, that's not very, um, not very good, is it? And then no, well, they don't reproduce fast enough. Like they're not the, the chicken that can sustain. Like it's hard to harvest penguins sustainably. Slow breeders and uh, like all seabirds, they live long and start breeding late, and then usually not raise many offsprings. It's not a, a good species to harvest if you want to keep the population alive. I have to remember to come back to, to, to this point. but um, <laughs> We've skipped already quite a few of your other I, questions. Well, do. <laughs> don't worry. It, it, the, that, it's, it's part of the unique charm of the show. The uh, So uh, after the Maori have hunted at least one species to extinction, then New Zealand was discovered. People discovered New Zealand. Yeah. I know, I know. That's why, of course, that's why I say it. It was, but yes, New Zealand was discovered, and as part of that discovery, very useful animals like mice and and all sorts of rats and stoats and all all those really good things were were brought in. Did they? Did you ever get feral goats happening in New Zealand as well? Yeah, actually, but yeah. they get you can get rid of them relatively easily. Whereas stoats are so clever there and rats as well as they're so hard to get rid of. And so you end up having a sustainable harvest of rats and stoats, unfortunately, rather than really getting on top of their populations. I know I've spoken to Andrew Digby about about those animals and their effect on uh, Kakapo and Takahe, mm. but how have they impacted the penguin species and particularly tawaki they uh, actually do even now like we have stoats and uh, even a single stoat can empty out a breeding colony that go around and see stoats are so uh, such a different predator from cats like a cat is quite a, a careful predator and doesn't have uh, nearly as much impact as the stoats uh, on for example tawaki the a stoat would go in and on, on an incubating penguin go, excuse me, and steal an egg from underneath an incubating penguin. And also, for example, stoats go and attack prey that's maybe 10 times their size. So we've got track camera like video footage of a stoat. Once the chicks are getting left alone and both parents are out foraging, that you have a, like a, a good size, maybe two, two or three kilo big chick on the nest, nice and fluffy. Lots of fat and the neck to, to chew through. And that stoat has been riding for maybe half an hour, chewing their way through the neck to finally kill the chick. So they they take big prey, those, those stoats. They're probably more a problem for um, eggs and uh, chicks. And I don't know of a single incident where a stoat would attack an adult uh, penguin. They're very well uh, at defending but you lo lose the next generation to these predators. So we make an effort or try because it's a huge effort to stay on top of stoat numbers. So they're obviously having an effect, but as you, as you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that the numbers for Tawaki are greater, have proven to be greater than the estimates in the, in the 70s. So... In the 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the 70s and then the 90s obviously mm -hmm. with the the more detailed work but are you confident that they are now maintaining their population level or no no because you can't really talk about population trends if you have no reliableness okay so that was what i was going to get to next is it because we don't know or is it because we have measured a decline or an increase it's just simply that we don't know we suspect there is an ongoing decline in some colonies, but 
the the method uh, monitoring those colonies initially was quite flawed in looking at a plot, a stationary plot in a forest. And penguins move in and out these plots and find other places and decide to, uh, you know, breed around the corner. So you have to think bigger and search a larger area. And then it's so difficult um, to even find all those nests. So we uh, tried double counts where you send in two independent teams on consecutive days searching the same area and you mark nests that are found by one team and by the other team. And by that time, you have a simple mark recapture and see which nests had been found by both teams. And in some areas, you have just 70%, you, you only found 70% of the land and can extrapolate how many there might be in total in, in the area. But it's actual accurate numbers. People don't realize how hard it is to even get population oh. numbers, let alone population trends, and then see when you have a declining population, what are the drivers? And it's always easy to say, oh, it's fishing or it's predators or it, it's on top of each other. And climate change in the mix, changing the marine habitats. And I'd, I'd argue we know a lot about the threats. We know they're having an impact. We, we are not at the moment in, in a stage where we can reliably quantify how large that impact is, but we know um, they have having a hard time with all the other changes where we can't do anything about in the short term. Like we are not uh, pulling the, the the switch on climate change anytime soon, and certainly not us alone here in New Zealand. But what we can do locally: manage predators, manage fisheries um, in, in important foraging um, areas, and manage human access to colonies, for example, or tell people to please not let their dogs run wild along the beach because dogs kill penguins. And it's the accumulative impact rather than... You, yeah. you very kindly introduced the ideas about methodology, about how surveys and counts had been done in the past mm -hmm. and then how monitoring is done now. Can you tell us about how the availability of new technology and think geolocators, backpacks, <laughs> camera traps, acoustic recorders, all those kind of things have helped you adapt. And, and I'm guessing you get much better results for a much less outlay of public funding, which I'm sure you're... you're that, that's right. I'm sure the government loves to hear that. Good. We can give them less and still get more. So t tell us how the study of penguins has changed in New Zealand in the time that you've been involved? When we first started, you know, we there were the first GPS trackers, for example, and they were huge breaks, and we took them down to the Snares Islands to learn more. Back in the day, we knew a lot about breeding well, but we had no idea what happened out at sea and with foraging ecology. These new novel technologies that allow us to track penguins with ever smaller devices and not only uh, two-dimensional, but get the dive depth and with if you have your phone and you turn it with these video games or other there's an, an accelerometer in there like a little gyroscope that can tell you how they turn and you get essentially a three-dimensional foraging trip and then over time will be the things got ever smaller with these initial bricks I, I wouldn't go back another 20 years when the first people in Antarctica put um, their first logger on a penguin just to see where they're going those, have you seen the pictures of this orange jacket? They look like a Sherpa, like a wonder that they even made it to the sea and then didn't straight drown straight away. Like it was ridiculously large. And now with the technology, we're, we're talking about matchbox size loggers that have a depth sensor, a salinity sensor, GPS, little GPS antenna. And they're bloody expensive too, because it's like you're throwing your laptop computer into the sea and hope the penguin won't wreck it and bring it back. Because um, that's the trouble with these loggers. You have to get them back to read the data. To get and the data. Can, can, can I ask you, you just said they're, they're hellishly expensive. For for people who aren't in the field, What? how do you design a study like that and what does it cost? How many penguins do you need to put your, your, your little matchbox tra recorder? I nearly called mm -hmm. it a transmitter, but it's not a transmitter. Yeah, you can have transmitters as well. They just have yeah. an antenna poking that, out. That, that's yeah. right. That's that's a different thing. So let's let's first talk about just like the the data logger, which is not a transmitter. How how much do they cost, and how many do you need out at any one time to make 
a study meaningful or statistically relevant or mm-hmm. or cuz cuz you, you you can't get a lot of information from just one penguin because it might be a crazy penguin and it might yeah, not be no, Yeah, you've probably seen that cartoon of Gary with a with a transmitter on his on his back and there was some penguins going in one direction and Gary goes into the other direction and have that dialogue oh Gary what are you doing Oh, some scientists put a, a tracker on my back, and I'm, yeah. I'm heading to Belgium. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with their heads. Yeah, yeah they, 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 you have some crazy penguins, so you want a few different ones, and ideally you want some males and some females as well. So get, and then you dream of eventually knowing what the juveniles are up to, but that's an entirely different story. But you're gonna be prepared to lose trackers because the way. We put them on a penguin as it's like essentially with teaser tape on the feathers and you want to be able to remove the logger again a week without damaging the feathers because they need it. You don't want to damage their dive suit, which means some other if you go for a longer distance migration, you might be prepared to glue it onto them properly. And then they mold the tracker off, but they got to lock that device around all the time. And that's it's quite an impact on a perfectly streamlined mm-hmm. body. If we're working during the breeding season, for example, our larger cameras, we would put on only for one day. And the much smaller GPS dive data loggers, they carry for a, for a week. So we get su- subsequent foraging trips. Sometimes they stay out over, overnight. In extreme cases and really poor foraging conditions, they might be away up to days out, and but eventually they come come back and uh, feed the chick and bring the logger back. And in some areas, like in in uh, Fjordland, they sometimes do even two trips a day, so you get lots of trips, but quite localized. And uh, you need a good yeah a good base of data to. Uh, we never have enough. That's the reality. Mm. And we're making do of what we can fundraise. And these trackers are $1,500, depending on how many bells and whistles per match box, per, per unit. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you just hope our cameras are more expensive. Just the, just hope they bring them back. But sometimes they They're drop. Lost. They they lose yeah. them exactly yeah. because you don't want to um, have them permanently installed. You want them installed in a way that you can remove them relatively easily again. Recapture the penguin, need five minutes, take the logger off and let them go again about their business, like up the hill to feed their chicks. You try to minimize that impact you're having. How well do they adapt to being trapped, handled and and fondled with their scientific equipment? Are they? It's always a, a concern. There's all sorts of ethics about disturbing the natural behavior of of any animal to, in order to to study it do mm-hmm. they adapt well to it and and actually here's the next question too i'll throw <laughs> and i haven't out. even answered all my no, funding wishes no, i well, thought i would well, hold up a list well, and say well, but well, now we are on the next thing well, we, we, okay we'll, thank we'll you. go back to it but th- this question is really relevant thankfully yeah. that uh, they're quite long-lived birds so how long on average can a pair of tawaki live and then the the link really is how many times will do you think they might be handled if they're in a a, a well studied colony or population <laughs> we like we we don't have well studied areas quite yet <laughs> we're, we're just starting with the tawaki but we know a lot about the hoiho the yellow eyed penguin and the oldest penguin i've come across that was still breeding uh, was 25 years and you could see like in old dogs, you sometimes see these yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah and, and that penguin, yeah, certainly looked quite old. And it, I don't know, I haven't seen it again, but they can, I think they, they with Tawaki, I'd, I'd, if I had to guess that there will be some in the wild and I've seen some really old penguins, but they were not marked like males with a huge honker and that, that beak uh, continues to grow and quite gray in the, in the face and the top face saying that because Juveniles look super old. If you're one year and you have a gray beard and, and you, you look like you've, you're done for life, they look so old and yet they just survived their first year or must have been a really hard year. And then they mold into the pretty um, adult plumage and look nice and shiny and young again. Wish we could do that, Grant, actually. Yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good factoid that I didn't know. But I, mm-hmm. And I'm going to assume that it's um, common across penguins that it their bill continues to increase in size their bill is not like um other features like other bones that once they reach a mature um age 
that's how big they are. But mm-hmm. their bill just continues to what thicken and become like the antlers of a of a deer. How can you compare that that, yes. the, that this thing grows and grows? Of course, the the deer molt them off, but uh, it's probably mm-hmm. more cattle cattle's oh. horn. But do, do you think that a big bill is like a really nice tail for a bird of paradise? Uh, yeah, no, not at all. They're just the hunker to defend their territory. So. You have different sizes, like penguin. Like people always look at penguins and think males and females look the same, and they don't. Like once you work with them, the male is like in, in Tawaki is a kilo heavier, has a much chunkier bill just to start with. <clears throat> so even a juvenile male can have a huge bill, and there's always some size difference. They're very minute females, and some that are, are quite bulky and almost as strong um, as a male. And you can have pairs where the female actually. Is slightly larger than their male, but in general, the male is quite large. Yeah, they, they need to defend the territory, and a big honker helps them. And they have this nice hook that they, they draw blood. So you need to know how to, to handle them if you want to attach a logger, but they, they have a hook. And as they, they use it, it, of course, it needs to grow. And it's just like their toenails, they are, are our fingernails. Things just grow and They're get always, replaced as, as you use right. them up. And that's a big trouble, actually, with some zoo penguins that don't have enough to work off their beaks. Then they get this overgrown, funny, sometimes crossbill beaks that just, yeah, or hoofs or something. You need to maintain a wild horse running up some crazy scree fields will work their hooves much more than uh, a horse on a paddock. So it's not growing, you know, quite as fast, but it's certainly there's a trend that... Older birds often have bigger bills. So, and that's just, it's it, we don't have, and we're still, we just started to mark birds. So for Tawaki, it's a gut feeling. A lot of what I say, I don't have the hard data quite yet, because we're just now, we, if you mark an old bird, you don't know how old it is. It's adult. And then you can follow it through and, and see it a couple of years later, uh, again, raising an, a successful um, a, a chick and say, you look bigger. Mate, you had a really, and, and bigger in terms of they grow twice as fat just in preparation for the mold. As they go through very big phases and quite slender phases with the breastbone poking out after mold if they, they had a, a hard season. But that beak, you can always tell whether it's a male or female because that honker is really standing out. And I can send you a few cool pair pictures. <laughs> Always love penguin <laughs> pictures and, and, and being able to share share them around. We were talking about about the cost of of that particular data logger, and I'm I'm guessing that the transmitters are probably a bit more expensive, and it costs a lot of money to have people in the field. Personnel is usually the largest cost of any mm-hmm. kind of project. And you said the word fundraising, so Tawaki Project is fundraising. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, of course, always, because we are running that project on the smell of an oily rag and with lots of passion. So um, you imagine even getting into these remote fjord areas, we are piggybacking on fantastic support by, by local businesses. Southern Discoveries have taken us under the wings and provide us with free boat rides and we can use their kayaks to get to breeding colonies. And uh, further south in the fjords, we were collaborating with Fjordland Expedition. On the west coast, we have the Greenstone helicopters that allow us to hitch rides out to those colonies. So logistics is a, is a huge thing. Mm. And we're absolutely grateful for that, that big community that's on board and helping us and supporting us in the field. Because as I, I told you earlier, uh, it's really hard to get governmental funding for any long-term project in science you want these quick, quick, uh, sexy projects and not following things hmm. through varied marine environments and over uh, many seasons. And Which is one of the like, structural like, problems, isn't it? It's a real structural <laughs> problem with finding uh, quality, quality research and that, and that people like yourself have to design studies that may not be the studies that you want to do simply because it's the only way that you can get anything hmm. funded. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it's like you've got to make do what, with what you have. And anything we're learning about them is more than we knew before. But in an ideal world, you would have more devices and you would have more people in the field. And you'd ideally 
have be able because currently most of the people in the field last actually last last season we didn't have anybody mm. on a salary like we've been all including myself working for free and our time off in order to get that sort of data and i have really skilled great people that that um, work with us since a long time and i would wish i could offer them a salary but at the moment uh, we can't and they're still on board and still passionate and but i think conservation suffers from always assuming that people work with passion and for free and somehow they gotta feed themselves as well That's one of the great problems, isn't it, about conservation? Because we, we, I'm associating myself just because I, I sit here and do things for no pay, but I'm not, it's not, I'm not a scientist. You guys are increasingly expected to do things without pay, but you don't get people in other parts of government and the community being expected to do their core work for no pay like the government doesn't say we're building roads we're going to build this great <laughs> new highway but nobody who drives a truck is actually going to be paid their full wage we're going to pay them 10 percent of the value of their output that just doesn't happen but in science it seems to be accepted because we're you're all doing good work it's one of the things i i really hope can have a small impact in changing. I don't think people know, actually understand that Tawaki Project is something you do, but it's not what you do for your for job. Money. No, uh, it's, it's an expensive hobby, yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk about Tawaki Project. Who's involved? Tell us a little bit about the team and mm -hmm. then let's recognise the people who are supporting you. And Are there any formal affiliations with universities or other bodies as well? To just run us through. Oh, there's, yeah, there's plenty of formal um, associations. We started the Tawaki project um, well back in the day. The first recce trip was almost 20 years ago now, in 2003, at, out to Brexy Island. That's when I saw my first Tawaki together uh, with my partner, Thomas. And we always wanted to know more about them because there's so little known about uh, Tawaki. And it, it needed another 10 years and the opportunity, I had the opportunity because in my uh, spare time, <laughs> like for a job, I work as a um, scientific consultant and also um, I'm affiliated with Otago University at the moment doing lots of teaching. And that's a whole different story again, like trying to, to have uh, maintain face-to-face -face teaching under RET. But we started and I did a contract for a doc working across several different conservancies that didn't normally talk to each other on the West Coast and Fjordland and the Southern Islands. And we suddenly realized, hey, and this is an opportunity. We have all the key players here on the table and they're all interested in Tawaki. Let's start a project where we learn more about Tawaki, learn more about how many there might be their breeding biology in the different areas, their breeding success and especially their foraging ecology, their marine ecology, what they're doing out at sea because we had no clue what, what happened with them. And so we started very little and with uh, a bunch of international friends, actually, because in the seabird community in people and New Zealand is exotic enough that you go, hey, Clemens from overseas, Clemens Pitts, the director of the Antarctic Research Trust, for example, he came over and brought some some devices, some satellite trackers for us to put on penguins and other people, especially important, the Global Penguin Society. Um, Pablo Garcia Boburoglu is our contact. He's Argentinian and works closely with the University of Washington. There's lots of people around the world. A, a, a good colleague from Cape Town working for Suncop, for example, came over and helped. So we have a, a team of keen scientists that came in their spare time, come over and to help with a Tawaki project. And then we have a bunch of really cool students and community workers that, that just uh, say, okay, I, I make time for a week or two to help you out during the breeding season. And we had last season, I mentioned Robin Long before. She, yeah, she's fantastic. She's been with us almost since the beginning, since many years now. And then we have some that come back, for example, GIS specialist from Christchurch, Lindsay Chan was with us in the field last season. We have very keen students at the moment. We have Jeff White 
who's doing a PhD. He used to do a master's with us and he just started his PhD now expanding south into the other fjords. He worked in Doubtful last season. He's based in Miami. And then we have, and oh, and we just got featured yesterday, in fact, on the, if you pull up University of Miami, the main webpage, you'll see my photo of a Tawaki and a chick, curious chick kind of looking around that. It's pretty cool, like uh, featured on that, that webpage with a direct link to the Tawaki project. But I, I want to mention Blake Hornblow as well. He's our master's student and he did really great work together with Jeff in Doubtful Sun this year. So there are students coming in, putting their enthusiasm and, and their heart into the project. And uh, we have uh, lots of international Scientists that that look, yeah, including, for example, um, Tom Hart, you might have heard uh, from Penguin Watch, who said, I have a few spare track cameras. Do you want them to monitor Tawaki nests? So it's coming as a, it's a puzzle of enthusiastic people and gear and uh, big dreams. But yeah, slowly we're heading the right direction and starting to know more and more about elusive forest. I'm really encouraged that there is that sharing of, expensive gear between <laughs> between people well it is risky people need yeah, to recognize is. that it's a gamble because but in the southern hemisphere there's the on season that it might be the off season in another part of the world mm -hmm. and that gear is always being used and not sitting in a cupboard for three or four years uh, three or four months at a time but the so, problem is hey, with with satellite trackers and in that particular case you put them on for the winter migration or the pre-mold migration and they're gone and the chance that you ever get them back, you're putting them on for a one-off. And in fact, I think I got, oh, actually, I think I got maybe four or five back from the 20 we deployed. It's it's for the greater good. We want to learn more about them. We need to publish more papers. We're That's also a spare time job. That's a, once job is done and you have some money and food on the table, you go at night and fire up the computer again and write a paper. That's right, and I'm not publishing as fast as I would like to, but they are all on board. So there'll be co-authors in these scientific publications. And so that's the pay and plus the excitement and, and enthusiasm that we actually, we are learning new stuff. We are at, that's what science is about. We, we want to discover stuff we don't know yet. And not just anything, but stuff that can inform uh, a better conservation strategy. And it's really great. You mentioned you've got local businesses that operate in the in the region, in the broader region, that are helping you out because getting into remote locations and spending time there right. and moving from location to location mm -hmm. is yeah. wildly expensive. We really need to congratulate those businesses for being involved. And please, bird people, if you are going to New Zealand, you need to look up these businesses. Ursula, here, here's your opportunity to let people know where they can book their tours or their helicopter flights. Who should they choose? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Southern Discoveries in Milford Sound have been hugely helpful. And if you have the chance, they have the Underwater Observatory in Harrison Cove. So that add that to your tour and have a look, go down into the fjord and become a part of the fjord environment, see black coral and other crazy things that you can't see anywhere in the world. So Southern Discoveries, certainly Fjordland Expeditions, Abu and Mandy down in the Southern Fjords, they do really cool tours. And they're one of several businesses that, yeah, that, that are uh, helping, but they're probably the core. And I really want to shout out to the Greenstone Helicopters on, on the West Coast. Without uh, those guys, we would have never started working in these remote West Coast locations. It's much appreciated. Yeah, we couldn't do that stuff without you. There we are. <laughs> big thumb, big thumbs up for all of you because obviously they're, they're oh, making... Oh, I'm really important. Grant, I almost forgot because with COVID, you can imagine, currently boat tours without tourists, there's just a fraction of the boats. And we started to do a lot more of our work with kayaks, kayaking to these remote colony locations. So Roscoe's kayaks and Milford Sound came on board with these beautiful big sea kayaks and allowed us to take them out to the fjord entrance and land in crazy places where it's a bit challenging and a bit swell. And we would be gone for a few days before we bring those kayaks back. And we're really appreciating having access to those kayaks and thus those remote colonies. Fantastic. Good on you, Roscoe. Yeah. And 
I can't endorse any of these businesses because I haven't used any of them yet, but I would encourage you to, if you're making a selection, if you're going to New Zealand and doing tours, look them all up and, and remember making your choice that these are people who obviously committed to the cause because they're supporting the cause with their real dollars. Yeah. It's important to uh, support our fellow travellers. So do that. Ashla, is there anything that I have neglected to bring up in the discussion about Tawaki and penguins in New Zealand? For, for a few more hours, I think. <laughs> and in fact, when you first approached me, you said we, we're going to expand to seabirds in general because New Zealand is the seabird yeah. capital of the world and we have so many endemic species nobody else has. And most of them are in, in, in dire straits and most of them are very poorly researched. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to learn more about our seabirds here in New Zealand and hopefully find the right ways to provide. I, I'm a scientist, so I want to provide data and be able to communicate the data that makes better outcomes for, for birds in New Zealand. And since I'm a seabird nerd, that's what I'd pledge for. Guys, we need to learn more about our seabirds. Even the seabirds we know a lot about, like the yellow eyed penguins, they need a lot more help to even survive the next few decades here on the mainland. So we are about, and since this is the bird emergency podcast, we talked about tawaki that are doing quite great. And for me, it's soul food to go out and they see them successfully raising their chicks. We have other penguins, especially the yellow eyed penguin that is struggling severely and at the current projection like we did some population modeling and the trajectory is currently the actual numbers we're counting is lower than the worst case population modeling forecast so we are on track to lose them in the next couple of decades if we are not getting our act together that sounds like there's a whole other podcast episode to talk yes, about huge. particularly yes. I, I approach you about Tawaki because I found the fantastic website which let's get that plug in there Tawaki yes. Tawaki-project.org. That's where you'll find that. So yes. just in case we forget later on. Now, you mentioned you're a seabird nerd and New Zealand is the capital, the world capital of seabirds, I think. Did you see the, the, the talk on Twitter a week or so back that a New Zealand storm petrel was seen on a bird, offshore bird watching trip in Tasmania? No, I but that is really cool. They like storm petrels are crazy. Like they, they, I've seen them. I had the opportunity to work my way as a student, work my way back from New Zealand and back to Europe for six weeks. And the ship was so big that it didn't fit the Panama Canal. So we had to go around Cape Horn and the Cap Verdes and Falkland. It was uh, oh, quite an What an inconvenience. <laughs> yes. Oh. I saw so many cool birds. I yet have to go back to the Falkland Islands. But I've seen storm petrels like in 10 meter waves, crazy, just dancing around doing their thing. And and you're in this big ship. And that made me, I, I, before that, I tell you, I didn't know what bad weather was. So we have a uh, force 11 from behind. And and the, this, this big ship was surfing, on, was surfing on the waves. And, and you think of Shackleton and their small little boats and you go like, how the hell did they ever survive that? And there are these, handful of tiny fragile little storm petrels dancing on the waves and doing the thing and just completely unfaced of, of this crazy storm that made kind of crazy waves like we had a 40 meter high bridge and the waves smashed into us like it was insane these roaring 40s and 50s to experience the, the sheer force of of the sea and then realizing there's birds out there that are so little and yet so capable and survivors, real survivors. So if you ever feel small and down and, and thinking, how will you really deal with the next few days ahead? Think of these storm petrels that just cope. That's right. I really need to do more on storm <laughs> petrels uh, and shear waters. They're, they're pretty yeah, oh, amazing. They're amazing long-term travelers. They're absolutely stunning. Grant, I mean, have you ever? Oh, no. I let you go. You want to wrap uh, up? Or? No, 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 no. I, w I was just going to say there's World Albatross Day, but there's not World Storm Petrol Day. So now, what were you going to say? Oh, I'm just absolutely amazed when you stand ashore and see those fragile little birds zooming past, and then you imagine it's really this this sort of freedom. They pull you out, and our sh like sooty shear waters, for example, who we still. They have their nest in, in the millions around uh, New Zealand, on the uh, mostly on the predator-free islands. Yeah, 
they're all struggling with, with New Zealand must have looked so differently a couple hundred years ago. Mm. Anyway, but they take off and they go all the way up, you know, to to um, the Arctic and then I zoom back around and uh, you have other birds regularly going over to Chile or even during the breeding season, Cook's petrels go down to Antarctica and back and, and they're tiny and just these huge ocean wanderers that that live in both worlds basically they can fly for days with very little effort but yet our the sooty shear waters i just mentioned they're amazingly adapted for diving as well so they plunge and dive down 30 40 meters 50 meters sometimes and deeper than our little penguins and uh, mind you like a proper penguin like the tawaki goes more than 100 meters or yellow penguin more than 150 meters if they want to like having a flying bird being able to dive like shearwaters is yet yet another really mind-boggling thing i think there's so much we still need to appreciate and learn about seabirds uh, around this world and they're inspiring it's really great how much more aware people are of seabirds, but we still know uh, generally as a community, we generally know nothing about seabirds mm -hmm. and, and shorebirds for that instance. But, mm -hmm. but hey, we're, we're chipping away bit mm -hmm. by bit and bringing them out from under the cloak of mystery. Well, it's almost the cloak of invisibility, isn't it? For, particularly for things like storm petrels, I mm -hmm. think. The general public is pretty aware about shearwaters because we know about mutton birds and mm. I certainly at primary school learnt about the amazing wedge-tailed shearwater journey mm -hmm. around the world. And oh, then you perfect. find out, and, and then you find, gee, most of the birds do something like that, but we yeah, just crazy. didn't know. And like and, like those little Arctic turns going full circle almost, it, flying amazing. to the moon during their lifetime, yeah. That's right. It's amazing. It's amazing. All right, let's let's tackle the the bird emergency questions, Ursula. Hey, I I don't know. I don't know what you're going to throw at me, so well, I probably should well, have actually. That, that, <laughs> then we don't get a rehearsed uh, answer. Now you've travelled to uh, many locations looking at birds, but so we'll have to break this into two questions. When you're in New Zealand and you're just out out in the field, what Field guide, do you take with you? I don't oh. think you need one for penguins, but for general birding, what do you use to identify your New Zealand birds? You, to um, tell your tom tit from a tui. See, the, the thing is, the, the, we have so few terrestrial birds here that general seabird guides are what I would use on the Harrison on a ship. But if I'd go just somewhere into Fjordland and want to want to look in fact if I have internet access I very much like New Zealand birds online because there you have these little sound snippets and yeah, you can you look the calls. and yeah. yeah and so you have all the different because there's different dialects depending on where you are and it's just fun to explore and I've, I've also contributed I've uh, written a little a blurb about the Tawaki in, in the New Zealand Birds Online webpage. So check that out. But yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I absolutely love that. But if you insist on a book that you want to take, see, books are always so heavy. Like I am a lot in a backpack, so I don't often take books into the field, I must admit. I have my little diary. And then I, I take pictures if I get confused and come back and figure out stuff later, especially getting on my fish and other crazy or my botany. But the Heather and Robertson, I think, is the standard bird guide I'd recommend for people um, that just come to New Zealand and um, want to learn uh, more about um, New Zealand birds. Okay. But title? title? Has it got a good title, The Birds of New Zealand? I, it's just birds, I think. I'm not even sure. Is there any that I there's got to be probably birds of New Zealand. You're right. There's got to be New Zealand somewhere in the title. I was going to say you, you, that would be a good one to go shopping for in the bookshop. Birds. I'd, I'd like the book called Birds of New Zealand. Well, that, the extubated <laughs> the expurgated version. Yes. Sorry, if you don't know if you don't know about Monty Python, that last bit made no sense to you whatsoever. And if you do know about Monty Python, you are reciting the rest of the skit. No doubt. Okay, Ursula, we've almost worked out the next question. It's not going. It's not going to plan. So I'm guessing that your your phone is like your must have piece of kit for the field, or is yeah. it your notebook? I the phone. I have a little database in there um, where I record nest checks and everything, and then you just press sync 
and it's in the cloud and you That's don't right. have and to then, worry about transcribing. And with transponders, you just scan the number and you have it. And else you have this, I don't know, 15 digit transponder number that's so error prone. Like back in the days when I started, I've been writing bent numbers in, in these waterproof field books. And then you go back, you're, you're not even a yellow eyed penguin. You're a, some crazy other thing banded on some southern ugly islands. Where's my number a twist? And you go back through the database and try to figure out what you've, you've got to read. work out oh. what er what area you made. Now, so, these days, yeah. you, you run around the forest like with a transponder gun, but like these uh, big things you use for, yeah. for cows usually. But you can sneak up and often read read birds like yeah. you know, now they have just like um, cats and, and dogs. They have yeah. a little transponder ship in their neck. And yep. as you sneak up, you poke around the corner and go zip of like a meter or so di distance. And then you have the idea of the bird attending the nest. And it's straight in, in your database and you don't need to worry about transcription unless yep. unless you drop your phone into the sea, which has happened as well. But yes, um, yeah. you try to avoid that. <laughs> And of course, we're not following the script. That gives an insight into what I really wanted to talk about a bit more about the methods of retrieving data that is far less stressful than it used to be. You don't actually need to handle the birds to download the data off, off some no, of these devices, which is, which is great. What's your bucket list location where you haven't been where let's give you the option you, you can go to watch any birds or you can pick a seabird seabirding location but where's somewhere that you you're leaning back in your chair dreaming oh i'd love to go to see the curlews nesting in siberia or what how oh, funny how do you like i have yeah i've been working as a backcountry guide in the norwegian arctic and spent quite some time and had opportunity to work in the siberian yamal peninsula in, in particular but i'm so dreaming of going further east and kamchatka is a place that was always on my list and i've never managed to get there and so there's but there's so many places around the world. I'd love the opportunity to uh, work, actually, because I don't think I just want to travel. I want to contribute and yeah. I want to be part of a project. And then we, for example, in Siberia, we worked on scoters and long-tailed ducks and, and other seabirds. But there's all these other crazy birds that you then pick up along the way and be really happy about. So it's always yeah, out there and with open eyes. And I'm not a ticker as such. I, I really enjoy seeing birds and seeing them behave in their natural mm -hmm. environment, not just go, it was tick i got my life list now is 400 something it's more about actually spending time with them and seeing what they're doing yeah spending some time in some really cool areas in Siberia and kamtaka i'd love to go back to canada i had a year there not nearly long enough and so there's lots of places i'd like to go back and visit and um certainly down in patagonia like i'm, I'm you, you mentioned like i'm a bit attracted to those rougher areas of the globe sea and mountains and not so nice weather but yeah so uh, i hope we have a seabird project kicking off in in chile that i'll have some more time um spending down around those southern shores as well fingers crossed well, well dear listener if you're a regular listener to the show you will know that Ursula, in that answer, actually covered a couple of the next questions. So that was really good. And there's obviously so much more to, to talk to you about in, in your career and, and where, where, you've, where you've been. But we'll have to do that uh, another time. But you're going to have to tell me now, what's your bucket list bird? Oh, that's too hard. Oh, man. If I'd known. I, if, I, if, if you'd known, you would have had an answer just there and it wouldn't have been half as much fun. They, uh, because it's always hard to just narrow it down on that one bird. Something achievable Something. and yeah. close. It's, I haven't seen a New Zealand storm patrol yet. Can you okay. believe that? Well, I can, because and, unless you're heading up to the Gulf the on the Gulf, North yeah. Island regularly, you're not going to, you know, that's where they hang out most. But mm. otherwise, it's going to be a chance sighting because they just, okay. they just disperse. They just yeah. go. Yeah, uh, and they're yeah. tiny and easily missed. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, have I one. think that's a good choice. I think yeah. that's a good choice. So, the, but the hardest question is coming up. Oh, no. Yeah, harder still. <laughs> this is the hardest question. What's the best bird? There's no best bird. Ah, no best bird. Correct. Correct. 
<laughs> Correct. There is no best bird. Every bird is the best bird. Thank oh, you very sorry. much for that. All right. What's the best penguin? There we go. See, like I'm biased. So I'm really in love with those crested penguins and I particularly like Tawaki. But I'm looking forward to spending more time with erect crested as well. I know very little about those. So maybe in a year or two time, so you'll find me just bragging about how beautiful erect crested penguins are. But currently... Tawaki, they have more hearts. What can I say? But back to your best bird thing. There's some birds that are best at certain things and others are best at other things. And I absolutely love, for example, the Atlantic puffins because that's a seabird that got me into being chasing seabirds when I was nine and just coming along around uh, Norway and uh, kayaking and the Fortin Islands. And as you come closer to those seabird islands, they're like like beehives and all these uh, birds zooming around and you come closer and then they have these cliff nesting seabirds that are all black and white and not very interesting for a little girl and then you have the puffins and they just caught me and I absolutely fell in love and just then we had a, a sea eagle swooping past and grabbing a puffin out of the air but because we are there human disturbance it got distracted and dropped it almost into my lap so I, I had straight away a uh, dead then, a very unhappy puffin, and I felt for it. But that was the first connection and seeing all the combinations of birds do what birds do to stay alive. And they're all beautiful. I'm sure the orcs and the guillemots are really happy with your description of the just the black and white birds. <laughs> so you couldn't apply it to penguins and people got really target <laughs> hate mail. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, I know, but bird nerd hate mail. We don't want any of that. No. I, I, I hope you'll speak to me again sometime where we, maybe we can talk about those early years in the Northern <laughs> Hemisphere learning about seabirds. Listeners will, will probably, hopefully, be happy to know that 21st of February, hopefully I've got this out by then, Ursula. If not, it's revisionist. But starting on the 21st of February, we'll be back to Monday Megaphones, where we have a sort of panel discussion about issues in mm -hmm. conservation and birds and whatnot. So that would be a, a bit like Desert Island Discs, but with birds. And we can maybe talk about your career and how you ended up in New Zealand, perhaps. That's the seabed capital. Where else could I be? That's right. That's right. And uh, so it, it, it makes perfect sense. Ursula Allenberg in Dunedin in New Zealand, thanks so much for joining me on the Bird Emergency talking about the amazing Tawaki penguin. There's going to be lots of information and Ursula is going to send me some lovely visuals that we can, we can put in there so you can learn more about Tawaki. And, of course, Tawaki-project.org is where you will find everything about Tawaki. And there's some great resources about penguins in New Zealand generally, if you search. Ashley, you mentioned that you're on Twitter. If people want to check out your timeline and perhaps some real-time updates on what you're seeing or, or mm -hmm. hearing about, what's, yes. your, what's your Twitter handle? It's, it's at ULN. B E R G. It's um, the shortest I could think of. The way characters, I'm old Twitter, so where you had very limited characters. So it's at U L N B E R G. And I must admit, I'm not spending nearly enough time on Twitter. I really enjoy catching up um, on a weekend. But when I'm in the field and have reception, I'd tweet some crazy pics and yeah. But well, it's, it's very occasional. You, you don't get um, swamped with, you know, information. Yeah, no, that, that's unlike my Twitter feed. Yours is always impactful and important when there's something out there, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's all. That always makes Twitter fun. Ursula, I, I often repeat this, but but do you know that there's a bird nerd in New Zealand who has the best Twitter handle that there possibly could be? Tell me. I'm assuming you you are acquainted with Steph Burrell. Yes, absolutely. And do you know her Twitter handle? I have it in my Twitter line, yeah, but I can't remember her handle at the moment. No. Oh, true. And yes, and I, yes, petrol station. And, then, and uh, I remember back in the days, I thought, like, why would you have station there? Yeah. But yeah. And then, <laughs> and, and, and then you realize that's what we call them everywhere. Like, we're going down the petrol station. 
So, yeah. So there we go. Steph still is the winner of Twitter, in my opinion. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've done the goodbyes, but let's do them again. Thanks, Ursula. I'm Grant Williams. This is The Bird Emergency. That's Ursula Allenberg talking to us from New Zealand. I hope you've enjoyed our little chat about penguins. See you next time. Bye.